So welcome everyone, good evening. Welcome to our webinar. Tonight is a program provocatively titled, Where is the Hotel Pennsylvania Now? We will focus on the impact of demolition in New York City. When a building gets demolished, what are we losing? Is it good for New York City? And what to do about it? I'm Leila Logiziko. I am the president of the City Club of New York. I am joined by my esteemed colleague, Francoise Bolac, a member of the Board of Trustees of the City Club of New York and the chair of the Preservation Committee. Francoise is an architect and a historian. She's a professor with the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at Columbia University. And with us, we have assembled a terrific panel of experts who will help us make sense of this question. We are honored to welcome tonight Council Member Christopher Marte, who represents the First District of New York, Lower Manhattan, Tribeca, and Battery Park. Elected in 2021, Council Member Marte has been a champion for sound urbanism that includes pre historic preservation. He has worked with communities, experts, and all levels of government to advocate for resilient plan that protects the shorelines and our built environment. We're also joined by Alison Greenberg. Alison is an, a, an attorney and a passionate advocate for preservation. She served as the president of the Historic Districts Council. She has advocated against excessive and harmful demolition of New York's historic fabric for the past decade. She has also advocated for upholding the integrity of the city's landmarks law. We're very glad to welcome Rick Cook, who is a renowned architect for his expertise in designing history in historic districts. He has received numerous awards for projects such as reimagining 19th century warehouses in the South Street Seaport Historic District for residential repurposing. His recent endeavors include restoring New York's West Side industrial infrastructure. Rick has developed a deep expertise in the environmental impact of demolition and construction, and he has developed environmentally sound practices for his projects. So thank you so much. And let me tell you a little bit about uh, the event tonight. Uh, our uh, esteemed colleague, Francoise Bolac, is going to give us a presentation on uh, buildings that have been demolished in the recent past. Uh, this is you know, to give a little bit of context as to what has happened. And then we will uh, you know, dig and delve uh, deep into uh, a number of topics around uh, demolition of buildings, whether actually they are uh, you know, historic buildings, beautiful buildings, uh, significant buildings, buildings that are uh, meaningful for cultural reasons, uh, historical reasons, uh, social reasons. We'll uh, delve into this and uh, we will uh, also take questions and answers from you participants, uh, you will see at the bottom of your screen a, a little Q&A uh, button. You can actually drop your questions uh, in this field and we will collect them. And towards the end of the event, we will uh, address your questions. So I'm uh, turning it to Francoise uh, for your presentation. Francoise. So thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. And here it is. Here it is. Um, okay, so where is the Hotel Pennsylvania now? Demolition, what are we losing? Is it good for New York City? What to do about it? Um, th these are just a few images to set the scene uh, of, of a number of demolition um, things which have happened in New York City recently, they don't all fall in the same category as you will see, but it, it, it gives us an idea of, of what's happened. And it really, as it is, it really is just the tip of the iceberg. So starting with um, the Bancroft building, which some of you may know, it was uh, just behind uh, Marble Collegiate Church in, in on Fifth Avenue. Uh, it was a building that dated to 1896, beautiful sort of late Victorian building, uh, extremely figured. It was demolished in 2014, it was 118 years old. And Yimby, yes, in my backyard, which we all know is very you know, favorable to development, 
even Yimby uh, wrote that this building was significant and it should be preserved in some fashion, that this facade should be preserved in some fashion. But, but it was demolished uh, and the site has remained empty for nine years. Uh, apparently now Corn, Pedersen and Fox has been hired to redesign uh, a, a new building, uh, but the site has been empty. So that's empty site is an issue. Demolishing significant buildings is an issue. Um, the other building that, that I want to show you is 270 Park Avenue, which was a Union Carbide building designed by Skinwall Orrington Mill, a, a product of, of mature corporate modernism in New York, of which Skinwall and Mill were, you know, in a way, the inventors. Uh, it was a very large building um, and it has been demolished. It was 61 years old. It has been demolished and it is now the site of a new headquarters for uh, JP Morgan Chase. The new building is admittedly larger, uh, but one has to wonder whether the existing building could not have been reused and added to. That is a question. In a very different category uh, in the village at 14 Gay Street, this little three-story building was demolished. You see it here on the screen on the left uh, when it was still alive. Um, this is the building with a round dormer at the top in the middle of the block on the left. Um, very different story. It was demolished. You know, in the case of the JP Morgan Chase headquarters, uh, the building that was demolished was the subject of a, of a fierce and passionate campaign for preservation and the Landmarks Commission uh, denied uh, designation. This is building that was designated as a landmark, uh, but it became unstable because the owner did um, illegal work uh, in the basement and it destabilized the building. The building had to be demolished for safety reasons. So it was a demolition in, in extremis. Uh, it was a beautiful little survivor of, of uh, early 19th century. Uh, this is 341, 347 Madison Avenue. Some of you may know it as a building that housed at some point the MTA. Um, so you have it alive on the left and demolished uh, in the slide on the right. Uh, it, was, it was designed by Warren and Whitmore who are the architects of Grand Central Station. It was like the building at the north, which you see on the right slide at, at the top of the slide, part of what is called capital, uh, terminal city, excuse me. Um, very, sim very simple designs in, in, in buff brick and limestone. And so what we're losing here when building like this is demolished is, is we're losing the, the original context of, of Grand Central Station. So now the Hotel Pennsylvania, which is still standing and for which we're seeking landmark status has lost, has lost context. So, so the, the whole terminal city around Grand Central is losing a sense of, of wholeness. And that's very important. Um, in a very different category, this building on Willoughby uh, Avenue in Brooklyn uh, was demolished in 2023. Uh, designation, landmark designation was, was, was pursued by neighbors. Uh, it had a lot of support from local elected officials and neighbors and, and preservation organizations. And there was a hearing at the Landmarks Commission, it was expected that it would be designated, but a vote was not taken at the end of this hearing and the building was demolished the following day. The site is empty. Now the Hotel Pennsylvania, which is the, the, the title of this, of this uh, talk, uh, uh, was designed by Mackie Millet White in 1919. It too was part of the development around a railroad station, in this case, Penn Station. It was at one point the largest hotel in the world uh, and it was demolished in 2023. It was 104 years old and you see the slide on the right, uh, the site is empty. Who knows how long it's gonna be empty, but, but it, is, it is puzzling that, that this, this very large building could not have been reused for hotel or for housing, uh, but it is now lost and, and what remains of the area around Penn Station is losing context. And then we have the tombs in Lower Manhattan, which was designed by Harvey, Harvey Wiley Corbett, a very important architect of, of the 30s and 40s, who was one of the architects of Rockefeller Center. 
Uh, it's a beautiful Art Deco design. It's being demolished in 2023 for a complex that is not going to be that much larger from my calculation, but 15% larger. So, so, so we're seeing a whole, a whole lot of waste of material. And lastly, uh, this is not demolished yet. This is 60 Wall Street. It's a privately operated public space, public owned public space. It's designed by John Kevin Roche, John Dinkelu Associates. It's, it's in a full blossom of, of postmodernism. It is a very unique uh, space uh, and it is not designated uh, and the developer plans to demolish it to build a, a new environment, which you see on the slide on the lower right side of the slide. This is an environment, this is a, this is a space that's 35 years old, so it's not very old. So is it good for New York City and what, what to do about it? And I just wanted to give a little bit of context. Um, it is interesting that in the, in the Architectural Review, which is an international magazine, architectural magazine coming out of uh, England, uh, but it's a highly respected international publication. There was recently an editorial which was titled A Moratorium on Demolition. And I find this very interesting that, that, that architects who in general uh, like to build new buildings would, would entertain this amazing idea. So maybe the tide is turning. And, and to conclude, I want to conclude on two projects. One is San Siro, who's, which is a stadium in, in Milan, uh, a rather remarkable design uh, built in 1925 and added in 1955. And, and this building was going to be demolished. And the Italian undersecretary for culture, Vittorio Sgarbi, stepped in and, and said, I am convinced that the stadium should not be demolished not so much for its architectural value as for the importance as a symbol and for the protection of memory. So it is very interesting to me that what is significant about this and about the Marks and Spencer thing that you will see next is that an elected official steps into the process and puts down a line and says, this is not gonna happen. So what it means is, is that as elected officials represent their people who voted for, for them, uh, this must mean that the selected official feels that he's representing the people who have voted for him. And I think that's very important. And the same thing happens at Marks and Spencer in, in, on Oxford Street. Uh, the demolition of the building had been approved by the relevant committees. And, and Michael Gove, who was the Secretary of State, stepped in the process and stopped the process and disapproved the demolition and said that this should not be demolished. The case is being, of course, litigated because Marks and Spencer's, Spencer is, is um, suing. But, but what is interesting there is that the, at the bottom of the slide, the campaigners argued plan to demolish and rebuild this flagship store would push 40,000 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Now, if we think that 40,000 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, we've been pushed into the atmosphere by this rather small building, think about what the building on Park Avenue would have pushed, well, has pushed, and think about what the Hotel Pennsylvania, the kind of pollution that the Hotel Pennsylvania has pushed. So I will leave you with these thoughts. But again, this is just the top of the iceberg. There's been many, many more demolitions in New York City. And, and, but I just wanted to paint this picture. So I will now stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Francoise, for, uh, for this presentation. So let's jump uh, right into the, uh, the, the discussion with uh, our panel. So maybe what we can do before we start the conversation is uh, get our, our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, you know, I, I did a little bit of it. Hopefully I, I did a good enough job, but, you know, just to orient uh, the, uh, the, the attendees, uh, if you can, in your own words, uh, you know, introduce yourselves and, uh, you know, speak a little bit about how, how you relate to this particular topic tonight. Let's start with the, the, the council member, uh, Chris Marte. Do you want to say a, a few words? 
Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending. And thank you, Lila and City Club for organizing this panel. Uh, my name is Christopher Marte. I'm the city council member representing all of lower Manhattan. Uh, as many of you know, uh, all of this is really close to heart for me and a lot of my residents. We've seen a lot of our historic neighborhoods, our historic district, little by little be taken apart, uh, whether it's the seaport, Soho, NoHo. And we've been trying to organize and build a larger coalition, not only in city government, but with different groups that haven't been involved in preservation fights to push back on this administration so we can save our history, we can save our story. Um, and I'm glad to be here to, to describe what we're doing, not only on the legislative front, but what we can do as a greater coalition. Great. Th thank you so much, Council Member. Um, Allison uh, Greenberg, do you want to say a few words about who you are? I think everybody knows you here, but um, just uh, called her to say it again and welcome. Thank you. I'll just add that by day, I'm an advocate for um, my clients and I don't focus on land use. I focus on employment law and business litigation, but um, the same principles that I um, focus on in that world and in my employ in my in my profession are what have brought me to historic preservation. It's it's about the values of the aesthetics, history, cultural importance, but it's also about the importance of the ci civics process and the frustration with how the process gets thwarted. So um, I, I feel a lot of outrage about the demolitions here in the city and around the world that that didn't have to happen. And um, I'm so glad that HDC has taken an active role in coming up with new initiatives and being out there in the streets um, to draw attention and to seek positive change. Thank you so much, Allison. And uh, Rick Cook, thank you so much for being with us. I think everybody also knows you. Uh, you've done a lot of work in historic districts and uh, we're really thrilled to have you uh, during this uh, th this conversation. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm Rick Cook. I'm the founding partner of Cook Fox Architects. And for me, I've been fascinated by how both environmental conservation and historic preservation are linked as stewardship sister ethics. So I've been fascinated by that. And uh, one of the things I think that we've missed is while we've really focused in on operational carbon, local on 97 and uh, how buildings use energy, we have really missed the boat on embodied carbon and valuing the embodied carbon as Francois uh, mentioned what's embodied in these buildings. So that's a that's a, a, a huge fascination for me. And I think it's something we can do a lot of work. And as an architect, I'm probably in the carrot and stick of preservation. I'm a little bit more on the carrot side. How can we incentivize people to protect these buildings? Thank you. Yes, terrific. Um, so, you know, I, I think that uh, Francois' presentation is is a good uh, way for people, you know, to get this jolt and the sort of, uh, you know, outrage that Allison was referring to. Um, you know, when we see these buildings, when, you know, anyone who has passed the, uh, uh, you know, the site of the former uh, Hotel Pennsylvania, you, know, you, you, you walk there and, and you look at this huge patch of blue sky that, you know, used to be occupied by the building, and you really have have the, this gut reaction. Um, let's start with that. You know, wh why are we, wh what are we losing when we lose uh, the, these buildings? And, you know, maybe we can start with you, Allison. You had started, you know, touching on that. It, it is obviously much more than just, you know, uh, you know, a few tons of bricks and cement and some glass. So it's really um, several layers of, of, what we lose. There's, of course, it, and in a sense, it's a cliche, but it's a starting point, which is we lose our sense of place. But then it's, what does that mean? We lose a sense of orientation. And for many of us, we are residents of the city. We um, have businesses in the city and we have um, maybe not a legal right, but we have a sense of psychological right and investment and care for the city where we deserve to know where we are. And beyond that, whether it's the Hotel Pennsylvania or a beautiful building on a corner in Brooklyn, it's a matter of 
losing the fabric of a neighborhood. And while, and, and this will get into what we're talking about tonight because the landmarks law can only cover certain issues and it, it doesn't cover use and it doesn't cover certain um, very important concerns. But if, if we put aside which law governs, we lose a sense of place, we lose neighborhood fabric, we lose the small businesses, we lose the people who live there. So we have residential and commercial displacement. We've seen that with rezonings that have taken place. And um, it, it has a tremendous impact on the psyche of the people who live in these places and travel through these places every day. And when these demolitions occur and they make way for something new, it's typically something that is unfortunately sanitized that doesn't reflect uh, inspiring um, values for us. And it creates a sense of frustration with the system. And I know that so many in the historic preservation community have a very strong um, sense of frustration, anger at times with the process failing um, and, and with the people who are supposed to be the stewards of, of preservation, um, you know, who are in charge of protecting our historic buildings, the, the, yeah. the chair of the LPC. When we, when we lose um, hope in the civic process, then we lose a sense of how can we preserve these buildings? Yeah, no, that's that's a very good point. Uh, you know, it's it's a very good uh, segue to to actually ask the question to the uh, to the council member. You know, I think that you you have represented your district uh, in in a way that you know really uh, puts historic preservation front and center. Uh, you know, this is something that is very important for uh, your constituents. They have made it abundantly clear, and because you know, in the end, they're they're good and sound urban policies. Uh, speak a little bit about maybe your own frustrations with the system and, uh, you know, how you see uh, the, the process working. Is are, are, are we missing out on some tools that may be in the toolbox that we should use more? Um, you know, help us see a, a glimmer of hope. I'll try. <laughs> um, but I always ask myself, uh, demolition for what? And demolition for who? Right? when I think Allison touched on it really well, it's like, what are we losing? We're losing our small businesses and what's gonna go in there instead. It's gonna probably be a luxury condo with um, you know, a tenant that has the highest rating, which many of our small immigrants, small, especially in immigrant communities, will never be able to achieve, especially for their first small business. So what we see there is typically banks, Rite Aids, uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies. And why are we doing that? It's not helping our city. It's not helping um, our local ecosystem or our local economy. So that's always in the top of mind. And what always comes down to is for profit, right? The profit of developers, profit for construction companies. And, and I think that's what really angers and frustrates people. And that's what shows that this process is broken. Um, but there's a lot of things that we can do. Uh, currently, me and my team, we're working on two pieces of legislation that can, you know, help us stop this from happening moving forward. One of the legislation is a demolition notification bill. So LPC has to notify not only the city council, but the community board of any foreseeable demolition. And the council member would have the opportunity once notified to call up that application. Um, and so that gives us an opportunity to understand why the demolition is happening. Uh, maybe we can figure out ways to avoid it. But secondly, it also puts LPC on the spot in a city council committee telling us why they can't landmark it. And so when we look at 60 Wall Street, when we look at 441 Willoughby Street, a lot of those happened because of a lack of notification, where they told us after the fact that the buildings were coming down or after the fact that city planning had voted to move forward. And so at least that'll give us time to push back, to organize, uh, to do what we can to make sure that these buildings aren't demolished just because of neglect or just because of profit. Uh, the second legislation is putting an actual demolition fee, making sure that developers have an incentive 
to not move forward with demolition and choose adaptive reuse or find other ways to convert the building, whether it's for commercial to residential or for other uses. And so by putting a fee and a price tag, it'll make people second guess uh, whether they're gonna move forward and not only spend money to demolish a building, but also uh, understanding the cost of the environment that's involved as well. And so calculating that not just through uh, an application fee, but what's the cost to our city and making developers pay that amount and using that fund if they do move forward for preservation initiatives. You know, one of the biggest com complaints that we get from LPC is that we don't have enough money. We don't have enough staff to review these applications. Well, this would be a way to give them uh, or inject enough cap uh, funding for them to have a team in place to review these applications. Yeah, it, it's actually the, the smallest city agency, and it's not even an agency, it's a commission, uh, you know, with a staff. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were actually told, uh, you know, in, in passing by some insiders, you know, this information is unverified, but, you know, coming from a very, very solid source that uh, the staff from LPC is actually not allowed to speak with the commissioners, which is, you know, quite, quite, uh, you know, striking, you know, it has to basically go through, you know, some official channels. Um, but, you know, turning, I, you know, I think that this idea of the cost of demolition is really super uh, important and interesting, you know, turning it to you, um, uh, Rick, you have worked uh, on this idea that actually demolishing a building has an environmental cost. Um, speak a little bit about the, uh, the the metrics. You know this um, you know this notion of embodied carbon. Uh, help us understand what it means and uh, how we can assess it and measure it. And also, why is it not in Local Law ninety seven? Right. Thank you. I think that's interesting. Local Law 97, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, is what I would call a moonshot. It's an extremely aggressive measure to address our operational carbon. And we were all thrilled that it happened. And the development community um, is, is pretty upset about it right now. And they're still trying to vet it. But uh, that's really about how a building uses energy. And it's, it's kind of a crude tool. But what uh, I think we're talking about, we're talking about something like Hotel Pennsylvania, besides the shock of seeing that gaping hole and all of that building gone, the language around it is embodied carbon. So uh, total embodied carbon is often done in a LCA, a life cycle analysis. And what that does is also, it's not just the bricks and the steel and the mortar and the stuff that's there, but it also takes into account the site disturbance of the trucking to take things away. We, we think about it too, but we take down a building of that size, not only is it a glaring hole in our in our the fabric of our life, but it's also a lot of disturbance to take all that away and where did it all go? Was it all recycled bricks for bricks and steel for steel, or is it in the landfill someplace? You know, the question, provocative question beginning, where did it all go? But also just the sheer amount of disturbance on site and digging a new foundation and excavation. So comparing what's embodied on site and the carbon embodied in the creation of that um, versus taking it all down and having to build it all over again. That's the basic concept of embodied carbon. So again, I, I shared that on a little bit more on the incentive side because what we say doesn't make any sense to a developer is often pure dollars and cents. It's what can be financed. How can you borrow the money to do it? And another component that Councilman or Marte brought up was that when we asked, why would you demo this building? Well, we're still not even sure when the new building would come. Part of it is our, our, our tax policy, taxation policy. So if we, there are other tools, other policy tools that I think that we could use as preservationists. So if it's true that one of the reasons they tore that building down is that vacant site was going to pay far less taxes than an empty hotel, then we should be able as, as, a, as a city to think about that and say that we don't want to incentivize the demolition and the holding of an empty site. Financially, we want to incentivize keeping it. So I'm all for some idea like an embodied carbon bonus. And I, I, use, uh, I use a comparison that uh, Local Law 97 actually happened under the Bloomberg administration when Amanda Burden and Alex Washburn, who I think has been on before, 
um, actually came and asked us as architects, why are we getting such flat, cheap looking buildings? What it's a, what's it about? And they asked honestly and, and cured with curiosity. And Local on 97 basically incentivized thicker and deeper and more massive walls by giving a zoning floor air deduction for that creation, it allowed us to do 30 inch projections for solar shading. It allows us to do photovoltaics and other green strategies on the roof. So local, uh, local on 97 was actually, actually what we call zone green, uh, was actually written around listening to the development community and writing policy around that. And one other quick little anecdote is our South Street Seaport project was commercial buildings to residential, and that was enabled by something called Article 1, Chapter 5 of the zoning resolution that allowed relief on rear yards. And that was, it was really about preservation of character of neighborhood, not so much historic building fabric, but that's also a very useful tool. So I, I, I'm on the side of let's make sure that we get heard and change policy to make sure that we don't lose buildings like the hotel bus right here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the the, uh, the concept of um, embodied carbon is actually not new. Um, dating back to a study that was commissioned in 1979 uh, by the uh, Federal uh, Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, uh, they determined that um, in a typical 50,000 square foot commercial building, uh, there would be uh, the equivalent of 80 billion uh, BTU of energy. Uh, so BTU, you know, stands for uh, British Thermal Unit, and it is the unit of measurement that shows how, just how much energy uh, was used to actually construct the building. So that is the definition of, uh, you know, embodied carbon. It is basically all the carbon that was used, you know, all the trucks, all the digging of the materials, you needed, you know, some sand and some, you know, to make the concrete, and you need, needed some sand to make the glass, and uh, you excavated some marble because because you wanted a nice fancy lobby and uh, you know you uh, forged some metal for your doors and your framing all of this basically all the energy that goes into getting the materials creating the materials getting the materials to the site and assembling the materials you know all the construction and all the machinery that is your embodied carbon when you demolish a building you basically you know like obliterate all this carbon that was used that is basically contained uh, in the building. But if you look at, you know, if you think of the, the life cycle of a building, that's all, you know, demolition is only a third of the process. So, you know, you, you build a building, you, you know, for some reason decide that you no longer like it, you know, 100 years later or 35 years later, it doesn't matter. You don't like it, you want to do something else, you demolish the building. So you release all this carbon. But then, you still need to expand more carbon to build a new building. And then even if you take the argument that your new building is going to be more energy efficient, which you know still remains to be seen because you know older buildings are actually in some respects very energy efficient or can be made to be even more energy efficient, then um, how, how can we actually compel the you know the the metrics uh, to to actually take that into account. So when you're uh, applying to the Department of Buildings for a new building, uh, is it possible to say something along the lines of you know show us how much energy you're going to expand and prove that it's going to be more efficient than repurposing the building, expanding it, uh, you know, maybe uh, constructing a couple of uh, additions. Um, and wh where would that be? And maybe, um, uh, Chris, that can be a question for you. Can we, should, do we have to reform the seeker manual? Uh, I know, don't shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, we, of course we do. We need it so bad. Um, and, uh, you know, can, can, can we, uh, you know, advocate for some legislative solutions on that specifically? Yeah. Or, you know, especially with the current administration, might be hard to, to even touch on that, right? We're, we're in the process right now of the city of yes, where we're doing citywide text amendment on everything you can see or, or watch and, and see in this in your city. Um, but I think there's possibilities when it comes to a charter amendment through a referendum, 
right, especially when it comes to environmental impact. When we looked at the statewide referendum that we had a few years ago about, you know, our access to light, air, and drinkable water, that was one way where we were able to go around our legislative body, our executive body, to allow the people to have a voice. And I think that's what we need to do now, especially since climate change is here, right? When you have, when you're breathing in smoke from Canada, when you have you know, one out of a hundred year flooding or storms on a weekly basis. Like, I think it's on everyone's mind and I think it's a unifier. And I think this is why it's really important to really talk about embodied carbon because it unifies, you know, preservationists who are typically much older uh, with the next generation, right? And about solving this climate crisis today. Um, and I think adaptive reuse, I think, making sure that we can stop demolition, especially at the rate we're going, um, can actually solve our, and help us hit our climate goals as a city and as a state. Actually, I, I wanna go to you, uh, Allison, as the uh, the president of, uh, of the Historic Districts Council, you did uh, do a lot of organizing, you attended numerous, uh, you know, protests and, you know, you joined coalitions and you've, you've been really a fighter. And, you know, you, you are, uh, you know, on the ground uh, meeting with these preservationists. Actually, my experience has been that lots of younger folks uh, and, you know, people who are not mostly from Manhattan, uh, you know, it's not a Manhattan centric uh, movement necessarily um, have been actually very sensitive to these issues, including the issue of, of environment. I mean, it is just so incredibly dumb to put a whole building into a dumpster. Yes, it is dumb. <laughs> and um, and and the point you're making is 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 a point well taken and it's worth uh, reiterating that we have to work as a coalition and um, I have to say human scale has done a phenomenal job of bringing together many different groups, associations um, where there's an underlying common thread and it's frustration with the system when it comes to land use, housing um, and also commercial use. And, um, so here we have to be reaching out to environmentalists. We have to be focusing on this issue because it's so important. It's a way to bring more people into our, um, our joint efforts, the efforts of people who are here tonight, uh, listening and participating. Um, one other point I'd like to make though, going back, um, because the council member talked about a couple of very important initiatives. I believe that part of the um, notification initiative, um, or it could be a separate initiative, but it's something I, I want to just draw attention to. And that is that HDC years ago had worked on a draft demolition delay proposal. And um, David Goldfarb, a past president of HDC, put a lot of work and effort into that and was able to get a lot of council support, but ultimately it failed. But um, we, we want that to be reconsidered. And, and this would be a local law that would would um, cause a delay for 12 months um, of a demolition if the building is um, not already a landmark, if the LPC um, it, it has an opportunity to consider this building and to determine whether it has um, appropriate um, grounds to be protected. But if the building is 50 years or older or whatever the ultimate age of the building is decided, whether it's 50 years or some other um, age of the building, that would be the starting point. And then consideration of appropriateness, worthiness for protection would take place. We need something like that because otherwise we have um, this problem with developers pulling down buildings while a matter is before the LPC. And this is what happened in Brooklyn with Willoughby, 441 Willoughby, and we can't afford to let this continue happening. It was not the first time, but we want it to be the last time. We need to have some kind of delay mechanism in place in order to prevent those types of demolitions. So I just yeah. wanted to mention that. 
Yeah, oh, yeah. no, that's that that's uh, that, that's very very important um, because you know Willoughby is really the the poster child for uh, you know a, a real tragedy. It should never have happened, and you know I think there was uh, you know administrative will to actually really consider the merits. I think that you know the commissioners felt that you know it was really a worthy building, um, and uh, you know it was for a variety of reasons, you know, the, the delayed action on their end uh, really benefited uh, the, the developer that, you know, ended up, uh, and, and, you know, so once again, it's one of those really, you know, punch in the gut uh, type of feeling that, you know, this very fine and very, uh, very beautiful building uh, was was demolished and will sit empty, uh, you know, a vacant site for for, for a long time. Um, you know, on on the uh, the LEED certification, this is something that I know, Francoise, you're uh, very passionate about. Uh, you know, a, a new building can get uh, LEED certification at, you know, various levels, uh, you know, gold or even platinum. Um, when they actually took the place of a very fine building that, uh, you know, actually had a lot of embodied carbon uh, obliterated. It is likely that, you know, the new building that will replace uh, Hotel Pennsylvania may actually have a uh, LEED certification. Isn't that totally absurd? It is absurd. And it is, and it is something that would be really, I think, easy to fix. It, it, it's, it's interesting, the LEED certification has been very effective in catching the attention of developers and building owners. A, a, a developer for a new skyscraper or a new office building, a new you know, type A office building always wants to pursue the platinum LEED certification. Uh, and, and so I suspect that the, the building that is gonna replace 270 Park Avenue will achieve LEED platinum. But because the, the calculation doesn't take into account the enormous amount of damage and loss of embodied carbon that results from the demolition of the existing building. So I think a very, a very simple measure would be to, to revise or reform or add to the lead certification the fact that a project has to calculate the amount of pollution that it creates by demolition. It has to calculate the loss of embodied carbon. And so it should be a, a simple cost benefit analysis. You're losing all this embodied carbon, but you're doing this other thing. So let's just look at the whole picture. And, and that can, that can, those kind of optics, I think, really matter. Uh, if you remember Mayor Bloomberg, when he was mayor, uh, started this whole thing of benchmark, energy benchmarking for the city. I mean, I'm sure Rick, Rick remembers it, um, where every building that's above, I think, 50,000 square feet has to uh, disclose their energy consumption and their energy use. Uh, so that's that's operational carbon, yes, but, but every building has to disclose that. And now you see more and more buildings trying to pursue an A certification. And, and they do that, they tinker with their, with their efficiencies and because they want to look good because it matter, it's starting to matter to people. So I think that if LEAD found a way to reform that aspect of its, of its you know, system, I think it could have a great, a great deal of impact. I don't think we're gonna, I, don't, I do not think we are going to avoid all demolitions. Uh, because some of those demolitions are really, I think, caused by the real estate market where the developers or the owners want to quote unquote reposition the building and it's worth more to them to reposition the building than to maintain it and improve it. So I don't think we're going to get to, to the place we're going to be, but I think we can, we can we can we can avoid a lot of this waste. It's and and just to add, you know, a note as an architect, it's not just a waste of materials. What build what old buildings do is that they are an open book about about art and architecture, and that's how we learn. So if we demolish buildings that have something to teach us, then we're going to be left with the same gasket teaching us the same lesson in the same glass detail, teaching us the same lesson. And that's really a cultural impoverishment 
because buildings teach buildings teach us these things. You know, we, we each get a slightly different lesson. It's not like a book that says this is this way. A building teaches many different lessons to many different people, and that's what makes for a rich cultural life. So it represents an enormous material and cultural ways. But I, I wish that LEED would, would see the need to reform itself. Yeah, you know, as, as um, uh, Ada Louise Huxtable, uh, the architectural critic said when uh, the original hotel, uh, Pennsylvania station, uh, you know, the train station was uh, demolished to make way for, uh, you know, what has been deemed, you know, the one of the ugliest uh, buildings in, in New York City, uh, namely Tupan and uh, Madison Square Garden. Um, you know, she noted that maybe we have what we deserve, tin can architecture. And we, I actually don't think that's what we deserve. We, we deserve much better. Um, and, uh, you know, if you, if you look at buildings that have been uh, preserved through, you know, some sort of fight, um, I don't think that anyone ever said, oh, my God, you know, it was such a big mistake to preserve this building. I mean, you know, there was a time where Grand Central Terminal were, was, uh, you know, on the chopping block and, you know, there were some great ideas to demolish uh, Grand Central Terminal. Um, the High Line, you know, the High Line has been just the epitome of the successful preservation effort, successful in every possible way. Uh, it has generated $4 billion in tax revenue. It paid for itself to the quintuple. Um, so maybe I can turn this, this question to, uh, to, to you, Rick. You, you, you do a lot of work in uh, historic districts and with historic buildings. Um, you know, how do we help reshape the narrative here so that, you know, the, the bottom line is not this uh, sort of like, you know, fast architecture, uh, you know, is, is the same as fast food, where, you know, you basically consume it, boom, 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 let's demolish, let's rebuild, let's, you know, demolish it again, uh, and, uh, you know, get, get a better sense of, you know, sort of like, we have the slow food movement, can we have the slow architecture? movement. <laughs> the slow architecture movement. Um, I, I love the reference to the High Line because I think we can all understand its success and how the authenticity of the actual artifact remaining enriched all of our lives and it allowed plenty of room for new landscape architecture and new architecture to evolve around it. So I think it's a perfect example. And this idea of authenticity, um, comes up. So uh, uh, what's interesting is we do have new user groups like uh, Google, for example. Google highly values the authenticity of original buildings. So they paid one of the highest dollar amounts ever for a building when they bought 111 eighth. And it's because it was so different and so unique. We, we were able to save the, the base of the St. John's Terminal as a platform for our new Google headquarters on the West Side Highway. It's not because it was less expensive. It was not because of any argument about embodied carbon, even though we've done the embodied carbon analysis about how much we save to, to make the new building on top, literally on the on top of the uh, St. John's Terminal, but it's because it was cool. It was authentic. It has something that's impossible to replicate. There's this issue of what do we value, the character, the texture. Francois was very eloquent about it's an open book about who we are and what things have been and our place in the world. And these formerly useful things are useful once again, it enriches our lives, it's layers of time. And I think the Highline does that. And I think there are a series of buildings uh, that do that too. So we do have, ultimately it's the customer base. Does somebody want a one Vanderbilt which in its own way is a beautiful building and helped to reinforce the infrastructure around Grand Central, or a 111 8th, which is a repurposed trucking depot, really, or stare at Lehigh building, uh, or in this case, the, the, the St. John's Terminal. So we do, we need to get across what people value. And Francois's other point about LEAD, LEAD um, is the result of hundreds of thousands of volunteer hours and is a tool and it's constantly evolving. And I think I'm, I'm going to ask questions and continue to press. I think it only makes sense that you'd have to calculate the embodied carbon that you're losing before you talk about all the carbon you're gonna save operationally. That makes sense. Um, 
for me also, I, I think there's another thing now that we're kind of more into the less tangible, harder to calculate, like, like net carbon. Um, but in embodied carbon, there's also embodied human effort, embodied even human suffering. It's the history of who we are as a people and who are these people who made these remarkable things. You know, in our office here, we're, we're on 57th Street in the Fist Tire Company building by Career and Hastings. And something as simple as stripping away a sheetrock box around a column and exposing the plated steel and the riveted bolts, people come in and they actually touch it and say, oh, I love these columns, as opposed to a big sheetrock box. It takes the anonymous away and it brings us back to, I understand that we used to rivet buildings together. We don't do that anymore. And it connects you to a history of place and the character of a place. And it comes back to what do we value? Is it simply a financial calculation or is it a much more nuanced discussion about what makes a beautiful place? What makes us who we are? What makes it the best city? Yeah, so it's, it's actually really interesting, the point that you're uh, raising, uh, Rick, because if you look at uh, you know the uh, the largest tech companies, uh, their presence in New York City is entirely one hundred percent in historic buildings. Google, we know where they are. It's Facebook that took all the, the uh, office space uh, behind Moynihan Train Hall uh, in the uh, old Farley Post Office. It is Apple in a uh, large building that is actually catty corner to uh, Penn Station at uh, 11 Penn. And uh, interestingly enough, it is in the footprint of the redevelopment of Penn Station, but somehow this particular building was not is not slated for demolition. This one is staying, not particularly more meritorious in terms of architecture. You know, it's it's a fine and beautiful and elegant uh, pre-war building. Uh, but you know, one could easily argue that Hotel Penn was you know more sumptuous. Uh, but you know, this one is staying, and this is where Apple wants to be. Uh, Mastercard, you know, Big Bang, they could they could build themselves you know any headquarters they want. And yet they choose to be in a historic building in the Ladies Mile District. Historic buildings are actually on black ink on the balance sheet. And I think that it is really important to reframe the narrative where, you know, we hear it over and over, hardship. You know, you hear, oh, the building is landmark, hardship. But it is actually untrue. It is entirely untrue. Um, so, you know, moving back to the to the the, the council member, uh, Chris, how can the city put actually more value into this? And then I, I want to touch also on the fiscal implications, uh, which are you know very 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 you know tangible. It's like real, you know, the tax dollars that are coming into the coffers. But first, you know, speak a little bit on how the city can actually see the, the value of these historic buildings on black ink on the balance sheet. Well, I'm going to try to connect. Um, I'm going to try to connect what Rick was saying to, to the next question. And one thing about embodying our values is the protection that these buildings have. When you look throughout Lower East Side, Chinatown, Harlem, a lot of these historic buildings are rent stabilized, right? They're keeping our neighborhoods affordable. They're keeping our neighborhoods working class. And so what do we value as a city, right? There was a, a piece in the New York Times last year of how buildings are being demolished that used to house a hundred people and now only house eight individuals. And so we're not only losing affordability, we're losing density, right? And, Every Twitter message you get, it's about we need more density, but it shows you that demolition is not always the answer to that, or new construction is not always the answer to that. It's adaptive reuse and figuring out ways how to keep buildings intact that have been serving our cities, but maybe giving them a different purpose or changing the interior design to allow more people to live in them. And so that's actually the financial cost of our city, right? When you look at the cost of displacement, uh, because a building goes down, what happens to those tenants? Uh, many of the tenants at 85, 83 Bowery, when they were evicted on a cold winter night, they all went to the homeless shelter. Um, and that becomes a price tag of our city, it becomes a price tag of their health, the price tag of the education of the kids and what do they become. And so there's a lot to consider in these preservation fights 
that's more than just making sure that we keep our beautiful history, beautiful story. It's about the price of the individual, of the people that came here for an opportunity. And so I think that's how the city can look at it. And that's how the city can use it to build a coalition, to bring tenant right activists, anti-displacement activists, preservationists, uh, climate change activists together to say, this is costing us in many ways. And we should fight to preserve these buildings or to innovate innovate the, the equipment or the skills that we have to transform these buildings to modern use. Yeah, no, that's that's a very, very good point. I mean, the, the human cost is, is, is real. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, um, uh, the fiscal cost. Um, you know, an existing building is going to be taxed at a certain rate uh, that basically is higher, uh, you know, the denser the building is, which is not entirely exactly true because, you know, the, our tax rate is really very complicated. But, you know, like if we want to simplify a little bit, uh, you know, we, we can say that, uh, you know, the denser the building, uh, the, the higher the tax rate. Uh, commercial building is taxed at a higher rate than residential building. Um, and uh, what we see, uh, you know, throughout the entire city is that you have perfectly fine buildings that get demolished, and then their tax base changes drastically and now they're assessed on the land which is basically taxed at the lowest possible rate mm -hmm. barely paying any taxes um so in the case of the uh, the bankrupt building that Françoise mentioned in her presentation a, uh, a very fine building through block very large uh on 29th street with frontage also on 30th street um this building the site has been vacant for nine years so it's nine years of forfeited tax revenue. Uh, the same holds true for uh, what used to be the Chickering building. You probably remember that Rizzoli, the uh, you know beloved bookstore, used to be housed in the adjacent building. But you know this uh, series of uh, you know three uh, row houses were uh, demolished, vacant site for ten years. Uh, and now Hotel Pennsylvania, massive, massive uh, site, uh, was you know recent, recently uh, raised to the ground, and we have heard from the developer himself. He's repeated it numerous times to his investors, which you know it's a publicly traded company. So we know that this is the time where they speak the truth because if they don't, they go to jail. So uh, you know he has repeated it numerous times. He has no plan for ground up development. So the site could sit vacant for years, decades, maybe decades, literally with a plural. Um, how much tax revenue are we losing? Do we know that? And is it time to ask, I don't know, maybe IBO, uh, the Independent Budget Office, or even better, the controller, to actually look at these questions? I think both. You know, I think this is something within uh, the jurisdiction of our controller. Um, it's a way that we can save money. And so this is something that my office is looking forward to, to, to writing a letter and asking whether the, our controller, Brad Lander, wants to work with us and the preservation committee to really investigate um, how we're giving away pretty much free land and, and not supporting our city, especially when everyone is, is projecting a potential recession. And right, this is a great way to make sure that developers and landowners are paying their fair share. Yeah, no, it 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 is really fiscally irresponsible uh, to uh, to to issue those uh, demo permits. Ha it, it help us also, uh, you know, think about that. Um, you know, if a site is going to remain vacant uh, for a long time, is is there a way to impose some sort of a penalty? Can can we think about you know sort of like anti blight? Uh, type of approach. I know that, you know, lots of municipalities uh, outside of New York City, uh, you know, in New York State and elsewhere and, you know, Massachusetts and, uh, you know, other parts of the Northeast have those kinds to, to avoid exactly that, you know, the, the site that uh, is, you know, vacant and neglected um, and, you know, causes the blight. Absolutely. You know, there was a huge push and there's still a push to do a vacancy tax for vacant small businesses, right? And we know how that can damage a community. And, and I think vacant lots are exactly the same. Uh, many times they're just boarded up. 
Uh, there's wild plants growing in there. There's trash being thrown in there. And it really creates a darkness in a community. And so I think there should be some sort of uh, vacant tax, especially if a lot is vacant for more than two years, uh, because it really shows you, you know, what are the motives of the developer, the landowner, why they keep in it vacant. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good point. So uh, we are already at one hour mark in uh, our conversation. Uh, we have received uh, a lot of questions in the, uh, the, the Q&A section. Um, I also want to mention that we have uh, almost 90 attendees on the call. Uh, it is really remarkable. And we, we thank you for uh, being with us and uh, listening to this uh, important conversation. One thing that I want to mention is that, you know, we have spoken about a lot of different initiatives, uh, different pieces of information. We will list all of this in the show notes of, uh, of the program, so you will be able to find them on our website as well as uh, the, uh, the replay on YouTube. Uh, so, you know, don't, don't frantically take notes. I mean, do take notes, but <laughs> we will make sure that, you know, all of this becomes uh, available uh, to you uh, later. Uh, so, we, you know, we, we have a number of, uh, of questions uh, um, that that you know cover a, a number of topics. One of them is about uh, demolition by neglect. Um, you know, maybe Allison, uh, you you can uh, you know tell us a little bit what your experience has been on the advocacy front. I know that uh, HDC has been uh, involved, and and you have been involved uh, as well um, with you know advocating against uh, demolition by neglect. So um, <clears throat> in order to, to do something about demolition by, by neglect, in the, in the Landmarks Law, there are remedies, and the LPC actually does push forward at times to pursue fines and um, you know, other, other remedies available to it in, in the law to, to try to get a landowner to do something where a building is falling into disrepair. But unfortunately, too often, even when the LPC is 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 you know working actively to uh, do something to to get the owner to take action, it, it it may just not be enough. So once again, it's a matter of looking at proposed legislation, perhaps increasing penalties, um, finding other ways to to really impact the owner's pocket. Um, but if, it, if we're talking about a house, it might be someone who is doesn't have the means or perhaps is living in another state. And so it's a matter of coming up with more creative tools uh, to do something about demolition by neglect. If it's on a larger scale, then it's, it, it's using a multi-prong approach. It's PR, it's getting people out, it's it's drawing attention, it's writing letters to the LPC and um, going to the council member, going to the other elected officials in the area, going to the people, most important, the people who live and work near that site to, um, to go to the stakeholders. And HDC always does that. You know, HDC goes to the people who live and work by the building to listen to them, find out what does this building mean to you? Because quite often it's a matter of people taking on a grassroots initiative. Um, for example, it could be out in Queens um, where there is a historic African-American burial site or, or some site where people who live there know more about it than, than we might initially. So those, those are the steps. But, but I do think that, that we have to take a bigger look at, at how we go about all of this because what really heartens me tonight is that we're having a conversation not just about historic preservation, which is, of course, what we care about, but also the environmental crossover. And we have to figure out a way how to make a breakthrough and to have more of a dialogue with more people who care about climate change and the environment. Because if people are marching in the streets about climate change, but they don't seem to realize or care about a massive building like the Hotel Pennsylvania, they may not care about the history of the building, but for them to not notice or care about that building coming down, we need to do more to get that message to those people before it's too late. 
because yeah. it doesn't make sense that we we aren't building that coalition. So that's, I mean, that's a takeaway I have from tonight that we need to work more on having that dialogue and building the coalition. Yeah. So I, sorry to go off topic, but I just think that's something we need to come back to. Yeah, no, totally, totally. So there is another question uh, about a specific building. Uh, this question is from a uh, preservation advocate, uh, Michael Perlman. Uh, Michael has been advocating for uh, the uh, landmark designation of a building at uh, 576 Fifth Avenue. This is at the corner of 47th Street. This is uh, one of the last historic buildings in the Diamond District. There is no building whatsoever uh, that has landmark designation in the uh, in the Diamond District. There has been already extensive demolition uh, on this block. There's barely any uh, anything left of uh, of the Diamond District. And uh, Michael has submitted a, uh, a request for evaluation, and maybe actually more than one. Uh, Community Board Five is on record supporting the evaluation of the building, um, and uh, LPC has actually issued you know their their Usual uh, response that uh, you know at, at the time uh, this is not a priority. Um, it is our understanding that there is a demolition permit uh, in place uh, for for the building. What's interesting with this building is that you know it could totally be repurposed. You know it is in a, uh, a zoning that allows, as of right, for a residential conversion. Um, the uh, the site that is adjacent to it is uh, slated for the redevelopment of an extremely large residential building that will be uber luxury, and we know that because the developer has uh, explained that to uh, to the community. And uh, but the, the existing building has actually a greater density than anything that can be built there. So, uh, you know, maybe I can turn this one to uh, to Rick. Um, you know, you 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 have a, a, you know, more of a carrot type of approach than a stick type of approach. So here we have we have a situation where, you know, the existing building is denser than uh, what it can be replaced with. Um, so you would think that that in and of itself would be an incentive to keep the building. And yet, you know, the building is slated for, uh, for, for demolition. So how, how can, you know, what kind of incentive do we need to put in place so that we don't have these kinds of, uh, you know, absurd uh, and, and tragic demolitions? Well, one of the things that saves some of the buildings is when they're pre-existing non-complying is the lingo. So if you have a site that's zoned for a 12 FAR and an existing building is 18 FAR, that oftentimes saves that building when it's on its own. Um, and what I was thinking about in the incentive side was maybe we could even bonus the preservation of buildings of character. Um, also, I think with the current administration, anything that uh, supports uh, affordable housing and housing in general is the other kind of thing that I think that we could incentivize. Um, it's instead of the simple economic formula, if I take this down, you know, right now I get $30 a foot, and if I build a new building, I'll get $120 a foot. Therefore, there's only one decision to make, which is the thing that brings the greatest return. At the same time, pretty much everything right now uh, is discretionary entitlements in some way. There's very little that's purely as of right. And anything that has a discretionary entitlement is now 20 to 30% uh, affordable housing for residential. So it seems like we could as a group, as a coalition, talk about how important it is to all of us that we retain building fabric. And that, you know, one of the arguments is, is that maybe the new buildings could be taller as long as we don't lose so many of the existing buildings. It's the kind of thing I think that's a reasonable debate for us to have. And if we tied that currently, especially with, with the crisis that we face, not just climate change crisis, but a housing affordability crisis in New York, and we incentivize that, that you could build more housing if you kept historic building fabric, that that was the, the kind of thing that could be entered into in an open discussion and a calculation on, again, this idea of value as opposed to just a simple economic formula. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, to totally, totally. Sure. Um, Layla, though, can I just speak to the, the Diamond District building? Because yes, of course, Allison. If, if the LPC has said no, but I see that an appeal was filed 
Um, I don't know if that was an appeal to the LPC or if this per if if um, a lawsuit has been filed. Unfortunately, the courts tend to defer to the discretion of the LPC. But an interesting point made tonight is that Penn Station, excuse me, the Hotel Pennsylvania was demolished, and the developer has said there's no um, plan pending. So, if um, the proponent to save the um, building in the Diamond District it gets a, a bad outcome from the appeal, it, it might be worth uh, certainly talk to an attorney, but it might be worth filing an action, filing a petition in court, seeking to stay demolition, because perhaps there isn't um, an immediate pending need you know, to demolish this building. And um, it also might put pressure on the LPC to explain why the building wasn't worthy. The LPC tends to issue a letter that might say it's it's not you know within our administrative um, priorities, but maybe maybe a judge will say maybe if it gets to a judge who will ask the right questions, that judge may, might say, well, why not? Specifically, why wasn't this building worthy? And if the petitioner puts forward enough information about the value of the building, I, I still believe that there can be a good outcome from a lawsuit, even though. We have many disappointments. I also see there was another question about demolition by neglect. HDC has done so much in the last year, uh, and year, year and a half in writing to the LPC, along with Village Preservation and other preservation groups seeking to get more engineers on staff at the LPC and more specific um, controls in place um, to prevent what happened at Gay Street and elsewhere from happening again. So uh, we welcome any ideas from you um, at HDC. We'll, we'll you know, consider those proposals that you have, but we have been actively seeking um, aggressive effort by the LPC to prevent these types of demolitions by neglect from happening again. Yeah. Yeah, no, that the, I mean, the demolition mining light is is a is a big issue that definitely need, needs to be uh, to to be tackled. Um, there is uh, an, another question about you know specifically about the um, uh, the sixty Wall Street uh, lobby. What's interesting with this one is that you know the the argument for uh, the uh, the developer is you know we just we don't like the style we want something different, but um, you know on the substance of what they're doing they are going to reduce the number of amenities. You know, right now there are, I believe, three subway entrances and they would reduce it to one. Um, is there anything to do, uh, you know, can, can we actually partner with MTA? H how can MTA become uh, involved in this uh, conversation? Um, you know, where basically it, it is at that point more of a, uh, you know, infrastructure issue uh, than simply, oh, you know, we like the style of the lobby. I mean, don't get me wrong, we like the style of the lobby and losing it is going to be a big loss, but on so many uh, fronts once again. Um, how, how can we protect our infrastructure? And maybe I can turn this one to uh, to the council member, uh, Chris. Uh, you know, we're having those discussions now. Uh, sadly, as we've seen in other examples, uh, the developers and whether it's landmark or city planning are colluding and, you know, they make sure that they get all the green lights that they need that are necessary uh, to make sure that some of these projects go through as easily without much attention as possible. But there is uh, a fight that's continuing at 60 Wall Street. We've been able to create an amazing coalition and thank you to HDC for, for really helping us out along the way. And, and we're, we're pushing back, right? Because this pops, we, the, the developer was able to build much higher and wider. And what the community got in return was this publicly owned private space and what we got in return was these access to the mta through the lobby of the building and through the exterior and now we're literally losing every giveaway that we got uh because one developer wants to make it easier for one tenant to move it and so that's completely unacceptable and you know it's really symbolic of the fight that we're really having throughout this city right uh it's a beautiful postmodern lobby if you haven't seen it, but it's used by everyone. 
you see delivery workers there, you see people waiting for the train, you see people waiting for their loved ones, people having a coffee break there. Um, when there were small business there, they were thriving. And it was just because of the pandemic that these small businesses shut down. And so there's no reason why these small businesses can't come back and why this can't be a vibrant lobby as it once was. And so we're continuing that fight. And I think, you know, talking to the MTA, making that public is, is, a, is a massive argument, you know, because as we see every single study about our MTA, about how our infrastructure is inaccessible, how it's falling apart, we're choosing to purposely make it less accessible to the public. And so that's a valid argument. And that's one that we're having, not only within the uh, coalition, but with the city and state agencies as well. Do you, do you think that there's a... If I could just add... A, yeah, go ahead, Francoise. A note to what the council member just said. You're alluding to a very, very large citywide problem, which is, which is that we, the people of the city of New York, have given up light and air in the form of, of taller buildings or larger buildings in exchange for bonuses, plazas, you know, pubs, uh, covered pedestrian, pedestrian spaces, these things which are supposed to be amenities to us, you know, the people of the city of New York in exchange for giving up light and air. And these spaces actually are suffering from demolition by neglect. They're neglected, they're not administered properly. And, and, the, and the people who own them and should maintain them are allowed to do so by the department of city planning. So if we're looking for solutions, I think that, that we should petition the department of city planning to, to really restore to us, the people of the city of New York, these spaces that were given to us in exchange for what we gave up, which is light and air. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's that, that's a very good point. And I just want to mention that you know, with the uh, the demolition of Hotel Pennsylvania, we are dealing with the same issue. There were uh, three massive subway entrances, you know, to, that basically lead to the busiest uh, train hub in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, because of the demolition, you know, these entrances are now uh, closed. Uh, you know, they, they basically had to build up around it. Um, and, you know, they're, they're uh, obviously unusable. Uh, this is a huge loss uh, <clears throat> to, to users. It is, you know, uh, 600,000 people using Penn Station every day. And uh, a fair portion of those used to use these uh, entrances and exits because they are on the east side of, uh, of 7th Avenue and, you know, very convenient to uh, commuters who actually want to go to the east side. So, <clears throat> we are losing a lot in term in terms of uh, of infrastructure as uh, we are uh, you know getting close to the uh, 8 p.m mark um, you know I, I want to go through maybe a couple more questions and then we can uh, start thinking about uh, you know uh, closing statements and uh, hopeful messages and marching orders um, we have um, another question um, from uh, Community Board 8 um, about preserving uh, tenement buildings uh, with uh, rent regulated tenants and small businesses. Um, you know, it, it seems that um, the uh, the LPC does not recognize uh, you know tenement buildings as uh, you know being historically significant. Maybe they have uh, designated a couple of them in, on the Lower East Side, but very very few. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and uh, you know use is not considered by uh, by LPC, um, and there is uh, no real appetite uh, from the Department of City Planning to actually uh, look at uh, you know preserving zoning preservation, um, how can we, uh, you know, petition for, uh, you know, better, better zoning and, uh, you know, maybe better uh, incentives so that, so that we preserve that. I don't know, Rick, if you want to take this one. Uh, so th this is a tricky one because uh, I, I think you stated correctly that LPC doesn't, under their legislation, uh, consider use, although the history of a place is ultimately use, and it is sometimes part of the story that someone will, will 
tell about why something should be preserved or why it could be altered because of its, its use. This seems like uh, more of character uh, zoning. We're, we're trying to preserve the character of a place too. And I think that we don't have, um, we don't have good language around it. And I think that public advocacy is one of the ways that we do that because the Lower East Side is much loved and very vibrant now. And part of it has to do with the scale of the tenements. And very importantly, the institutionalized scale of the mom and pop ground floor retail. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing we also get when we preserve a whole row of tenement buildings. We also often preserve very small scale uh, retail establishments, restaurants, creative restaurants, low point of entry uses, as opposed to, as the council member pointed out, the big drugstore or the big bank on the corner, which ends up in every new development. So I think this issue that we're trying to protect a character of a vibrant and diverse uh, city is the kind of thing that we could talk more about whether it's, it's, it's not so much a bricks and mortar protection of a building because we're making the argument because the tenement was an important piece of architecture, but what these buildings do to protect the character of our neighborhoods, the fine grain, the fine scale, the small shops, those are the kinds of things that I think we do need to advocate more strongly for. Um, it's, it's going to be hard to say that any one tenement is worthy of Landmark's time and attention to protect. In this one, I actually think it's more city planning. I actually think it's the kind of thing that city planning could help protect through protection of neighborhood character. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's more the, the zoning tool um, that, that needs to be uh, to, to be triggered. Um, one comment uh, in uh, the, uh, the Q&A, um, Ronedo uh, and related uh, do not demo without plans, whether they say so or not. There are concepts for the Pennsylvania site uh, from years ago. Um, there are definitely numerous concepts. Uh, the latest is uh, known as Pen15, which you know when, when you read the uh, the, the, the acronym, uh, it actually looks like a bodily part that is uh, sometimes uh, erected. And uh, yet, I think this building uh, is going to not be erected uh, for a very, very uh, long time. Uh, once again, you know, the, the argument that we're making here is not to say that Vornado does not have a plan. They do have a plan, uh, but as the council member was uh, indicating, you know, unless there is an anchor tenant, buildings don't go up. And uh, right now, there is no anchor tenant. Uh, the developer himself, you know, the, the principal of, uh, uh, you know, chairman and CEO of the company has uh, expressed that much. There is no plan for ground up development. The market is not conducive to that kind of uh, development. Given the state of, uh, you know, the commercial uh, office market, it is likely that, uh, you know, the situation is going to continue. And therefore, you know, although there are plans, um, they will not be built for a very long time. What's interesting to note is that this particular uh, hotel was actually uh, rezoned in um, 20, 2005. Uh, so a larger building had been permitted way back, you know, more than and, uh, you know, a little less than 20 years ago. And uh, yet again, you know, although there were permits in place, the building was not redeveloped, uh, showing, you know, quite clearly that, you know, although there are plans and intentions, uh, the developer is actually not pursuing them aggressively because the market is not uh, conducive to it. So, you know, now we have a vacant site and it is likely it will remain vacant, although we do acknowledge that there are plans and, you know, pie in the sky is a, a nice thing to have, uh, but not for us. So um, we uh, have gone through a number of uh, topics and angles. I think it's been a, uh, a really stimulating uh, conversation. Um, maybe we can uh, you know, go through uh, closing comments. 
let, let's try to focus on, uh, you know, the next steps, what we can do to continue to think about these issues, to, uh, you know, reframe the narrative a little bit and to uh, advocate for, uh, you know, tangible steps that will make our, our, our urban fabric and uh, our uh, tax base and, uh, you know, social and architectural capital, uh, you know, more uh, safe against uh, excessive demolition, uh, starting with uh, you, Francoise. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for but putting you on the spot. <laughs> it, it seems to me, you know, to me, the core lesson to this is we have to stop wasting. So, the, the you know, we, we're wasting, you know, cultural capital when we demolish buildings and we're wasting embodied energies so we have to we have to spend the same energy to rebuild the building and and more now what to do about it is i think you know we've talked about building coalitions between preservationists and and urban activists uh and and environmentalists i think that makes a lot of sense i hope this message gets through to the agencies which have the power to affect projects, so Landmarks Preservation Commission and the Department of City, City, Department of City Planning. I know it isn't part of their founding legislation to consider the environmental cost of, of their decisions, but, but it could be part, of, but without it having a sort of a legal standing, I think it should become part of their thinking uh, when they actually approach these problems. So, so that's what I'm hoping is going to happen more and more because I think more and more people in the world are mindful of the fact we're in trouble environmentally. Practically, I'm hoping that LEED is going to get reformed. And I'm also hoping that when that we could get some leg legislation passed that when somebody demolishes a building, they cannot get a demolition permit unless they're committed to building a new building within a year. That way we would not have these empty sites for as long as we're gonna have them. And that's that's an easy thing to accomplish. It's just a sim simple local law and simple and simply just apply it. So, but one has to be hopeful and I'm, I'm hopeful that this, at this stage, when I think more and more people become conscious of, of you know, the value of the environment, I think that more and more people are going to realize what a waste it is to demolish perfectly serviceable buildings. Yeah, th thank you, Francoise. Um, you know, I, I don't know if uh, Chris believes that passing a local law is easy. <laughs> I think passing any law. <laughs> is extremely difficult. Um, I, I, I will come back to you, Council Member. I actually want to give you the, uh, the, the final word on, on, this, uh, on this program. Uh, Alison, uh, give us uh, some advocacy uh, strategies. Well, we're almost out of time. <clears throat> I would just urge everyone to, to take a close look at Francoise's PowerPoint presentation and Marks and Spencer's in particular it, in that case, the, um, the the Secretary of State, that, that's his title, but um, he, he ultimately intervened and weighed in and rejected the approvals uh, to demolish the um, Art Deco um, retailer on the most popular shopping, one of the most popular shopping streets in London. Um, but ultimately, the the motivation was, was the environment and um, the the demolition of this, I believe the demolition would have allowed uh, 39,500 tons of carbon. And that was something that was cited as a reason to deny the application. And that was also a big objection from C20, one of the advocacy groups. It was about the carbon footprint and the failure to re reuse existing resources. So. Let's let's look at the PowerPoint. Look at that case. Look, look at that that um, that example of demolition being stopped. And let's take a close look at the common interest between historic preservation, climate, environmental protection, and so forth. Yeah. Th thank you, um, Rick. Your uh, closing thoughts. Sure. Well, similar to my opening thoughts, I think that 
uh, we could absolutely consider embodied carbon and not just operational carbon. And we can, we can hammer on that repeatedly. And that would in general tend to protect existing building stock, uh, take it into consideration. But one of the things I thought more about while we were having this conversation was the success of the environmental movement and, uh, and the young people and the excitement about the world that we're going to be we're going to be left with and uh, getting heard on that topic. And in the environmental movement, we move we move from doing less bad into regenerative and restorative thinking. How do we how do we create restorative landscapes? How do we have regenerative? How do we make things better than they were before? And I was thinking that those also apply to our thoughts about th this existing building fabric. And I'd like to say, I also thought more about it, that uh, celebrate the companies, we, we can immediately vote with our wallets and our voices and celebrate the companies that restore existing buildings like Google did by buying for almost $2 billion to 111 eighth and put another, at least another billion dollars into it. Celebrate companies, let people know how much we appreciate it when you love the things that we love. And in the reverse, how disappointed we are when you take away the things that we love and focus more on the restorative or regenerative aspects like we're doing in the environment when we're talking about the environment of our built uh, fabric. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Um, Council member, uh, your closing statements, I really wanted to, you know, give you uh, the opportunity to close this conversation with uh, your, your thoughts. Awesome. Well, thank you, first of all, for everyone that's on. It's been a really great discussion. Um, of course, when we introduce legislation, I would love to have the 100 people that are on today on the steps of City Hall rally to make sure that demolition doesn't move forward as the current practice that it is. Uh, but also I think as a preservation community, we have to stop being reactive. You know, typically we, we push back after a decision was made or after plans come out, or if we hear something, that's when we act. I think we have to like tonight, start having these discussions about being proactive and making sure that we start electing the people that are gonna follow our message, follow our, our what we want them to do. And I think we have to start looking at the next mayor, right? Whether that's six years down the line and start building a coalition to say, how do we want to see LPC work? How do we want to see CPC work, right? The mayor and his team are going to make the decisions whether LPC follows its mission and its bylaws. And so I think it's starting these conversations early, having a coalition, and, and being really blunt, you know, uh, when you look at this last election, uh, our mayor won by 7,000 votes. Uh, that's nothing, uh, especially with ranked choice voting, it really changes the calculation of how someone can win. And I think if we put our minds together, we put our organizing efforts together, we can have candidates that are good on climate change, that are good on preservation, that are good in tenant protection, that are good on a lot of the issues that we discuss. And so that's what um, I want to do. That's what I want to get people involved to say, okay, we know how things go when, we, when we're reactive, when we're trying to fight and put out every single fire. Let's think about the next fight uh, and let's start building towards that next fight so then we can be, so we can win, right? And that's why we're all in this because we all believe in this better future and, and we can achieve it. Love it. Thank you so much. It, it is so important. And, you know, we we are a, a civic organization and, you know, we cannot uh, be involved in political campaigns, but we can certainly emphasize the importance of good government and the importance of participation in our electoral process. This is so critical. We need to engage, we need to support good candidates, and we need to show up and vote. And we need to help organize our neighbors. You know, tell your neighbor uh, that you know you support such candidates because their positions are really good for the city and for the environment. I think we can play a role in uh, organizing. And you know, th there was a quote. I think it was by uh, uh, you know the 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 great Martin Luther, Luther King who said, "You can outspend me." you cannot out-organize me. 
And this is something that is very, very critical. Uh, you know, when, when we organize, uh, when we are together, when we stay together, uh, even if there is no, you know, total overlap, in our advocacies, this is how we make a difference. So I think your your uh, parting comments are you know very inspiring, and uh, I really urge all of you on this call and all of you watching this uh, this replay uh, to to really become uh, involved. Um, well, you know it has been really very very insightful and uh, great conversation. We have very stimulating, great ideas. I want to thank you all for uh, joining us. Thank you, Francoise, for putting together this presentation. I want to thank the Preservation Committee of the City Club of New York for the amazing uh, work that they do. Thank you, Francoise, for your leadership on all these issues. Uh, Rick, thank you so much for uh, being with us and, you know, helping us think about these environmental issues and, uh, you know, explaining to us how these metrics work and, you know, what kinds of incentives we can think about and, you know, how to, uh, you know, reach out to these uh, other groups. Allison, your advocacy is remarkable and uh, we thank you for it. We thank you for your, uh, you know, very, very smart and always, uh, you know, spot on, uh, you know, comments and uh, your organizing skills are uh, par non. And uh, council member, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time tonight and, uh, you know, helping us think about these issues legislatively, fiscally, and, uh, uh, you know, how we can, uh, you know, move this conversation to the next level, continue to advocate and really fight for, you know, a, a better environmental, fiscal, uh, housing and, and social policies uh, for uh, our, our great city. Um, thank you again so much. Uh, thank you to the City Club. You know, it's a great organization. Please, uh, you know, we are a non-for-profit. Uh, consider making a contribution you can go to our website, uh, city, thecityclub.org. You can find us online. You can find us on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. We entirely rely on your contributions. We are not funded by big donors. Uh, real estate doesn't have too much place uh, in our pockets, and we want to keep it this way. So we really need your help and support. And uh, you know, thank you so much. We will, as I said, you know, put all these this information into the show notes. It will be available for you to reuse. All of it is free, of course, and the replay will be available later tonight, so that you can you know share this conversation with. Uh, folks who may have an interest in listening. Um, thank you again so much. Have a good night.